Another thing that Rob Bell does that is um, concerning is he continues to try to say that all, in other words, all means all, will come to God, know that He is Lord, see the salvation of God, acknowledge Jesus Christ, and turn to Him. But the use of the word all to Him, um, meaning all, does not necessarily mean all in the Greek. In fact, Zodia, uh, Zodiades said that um, it does not necessarily mean everyone. In other words, if you have a hundred people in a room, it doesn't mean all hundred will be saved. Okay? It is a word that reflects um, the fact, and to be honest, um, there are things where I do believe it is all, but you have to read the context. For example, it says, every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. I believe that is all the way from the serpent to the saved person. Everyone is going to confess this. He will demand that confession. Okay? So, I do believe that means all, but the idea is ridiculous that all means all. I mean, we use the phrase, you know, why does everything bad happen just to me? Well, you know that the everything bad does not happen. Have you been murdered? Obviously not. You're still here. You know, I mean, there's a lot of things that are not part of the everything. And so the use of the word is just to emphasize your point. Okay? So, again, the sum of the word is truth. You cannot take passages and piecemeal them together and make a doctrine. That's where you get into error. And the centerpiece, the, the source of your doctrine, has to be Jesus Christ and Him crucified, the cross. You have to consider the context, the historical setting, and other scriptures. For example, he quotes Philippians 2.13 that it is God who works in you the desire and the ability to do His pleasure. However, He does not let you know that that is in the context where Paul says to work out your salvation in fear and trembling. So in other words, he's saying being born again is the first step, but you have to work it out. In other words, the mind, the way it thinks, is fallen. It's uh, unredeemed. Your spirit man's perfect, but the mind has to be renewed. That's Romans 12, 2. And so you have to work out your salvation. You have to take the word and have the transforming of the mind so that you begin to think and see things as God does. And so that is the working out of your salvation. It doesn't mean you're earning salvation or anything like that. It just means that you've been given a place to start, in other words. And you now have to become, in your thinking, Christ-like. And so, to work out your salvation with fear and trembling, he then says, but don't worry, because it is God who gives you the desire and the ability to do what he wants you to do. Okay? He also quotes... Psalm uh, 65, again, not giving a scripture reference, but it says, All people will come to God. But the NLT says, All people must come to you. Why? Because verse 3 says, He forgives sins. In other words, you, you have to go to Him, not Him come to you. And then it says, uh, He quotes Psalm 22, 27. Doesn't give the verse. I had to look it up. Kind of. Um, it's really kind of weird how he does it. But anyway, as proof that everyone, all, will turn to God. But the idea of the psalm, if you read it in the context, is his millennial reign, when indeed everyone will uh, be in submission to his rule. In fact, return means to go back, which has been the entire plan. He also alludes to Acts 3.19, where it says the restoration of all things. He doesn't say people. He says things. But the restoration of all things is to take the earth, its rulership, back. In other words, you take all the damage that the enemy has done and you reverse it and it will take a thousand years to reverse all that God or what that the enemy has done. Okay? So again, um, you cannot say that all means all. Now, he then quotes uh, a, a teacher um, in the early uh, centuries that um, his name is Origen on pages 106, 107. He quotes him as, uh, you know, believing in this doctrine that he's proposing as well. But um, basically, Origen 
is the founder of the false doctrine that Rob Bell is teaching. He's the founder that says all will be saved, including the devil. He was later de declared a heretic by the church because of this teaching. Let's look, page 102. Is history tragic? Have billions of people been created only to spend eternity in conscious punishment and torment, suffering infinitely for the finite sins or finite sins they committed in the few years they spent on earth? See the, the adjectives that he's using just to make it think that this is just utterly unthinkable that a loving God would do that. Is our future uncertain or will God take care of us? Are we safe? Are we secure? Or are we on our own? Is God our friend or our provider, our protector, our father? Or is God the kind of judge who may in the end declare that we deserve to spend forever separated from our father? See, the problem is that he's even asking these questions. Because the implication is, if you say yes, then God cannot be your friend. He cannot be your provider, your protector, or your father. See, that's the implication. Is God like the uh, characters in a story Jesus would tell? Old ladies who keep searching for the lost coin until they find it? Shepherds who don't rest until that one sheep is back in the fold? Fathers who rush out to Greece and greet and embrace the returning son? Or in the end, will God give up? It, the thinking behind this is ridiculous. Will all the ends of the earth come as God has decided, or only some? Will all feast as it's promised in Psalm 22, or only a few? Will everyone be given a new heart, or only a limited number of people? You're given a new heart when you're born again. Again, missing the entire point. Will God in the end settle, settle, saying, Well, I tried. I gave it my best shot. And sometimes you just have to be okay with failure. Will God shrug God-sized shoulders and say you can't always get what you want? Seriously? That is ridiculous to think that God is going to settle for anything. Again, it is not God who is making the decision to send people to eternal punishment. It is the person who is making the decision by not believing in Jesus Christ whom he sent. It's that simple, okay? And it really frustrates me when I read stuff like that because it is saying that God is a failure and that he's not a good God if that's the case. And to put that thought, to question the character of God based on your simple human reasoning instead of out of your spirit man is absurd. Now, we're going to read a few verses real quick. Matthew 25. Verse 46. If the master returns and finds that the servant has done a good job, there will be a reward. I tell you the truth, the master will put that servant in charge of all he owns. But if the person is evil and thinks my master won't be back for a while, and he begins beating the other servants, partying, and getting drunk, the master will return unannounced and unexpected, and he will cut the servant to pieces and assign him a place with the hypocrites, and that place will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. This is Jesus Christ. It's a hard saying, but this is Jesus Christ. Then, in John 3.15, he says, um, so that everyone who believes in him will have eternal life. The uh, condition is to believe in him. And then we have 17, verse 2. For you, uh, for you have given him authority over everyone, and he gives eternal life to each one you have given him. Here we see each one not everyone, each one that has been given to Jesus. And this is the way to have eternal life, to know you, the one true God, and Jesus Christ, the one you sent to earth. This is Jesus praying to the Father. This is God talking to God. And then you have Romans 5.18.
Yes, Adam's one sin brings condemnation for everyone. Here, that does mean everyone. But Christ's one act of righteousness brings a right relationship with God and new life to everyone. So what that means, now don't think, oh, it says everyone, new life to everyone. But again, belief is required, as I just showed you. It's everyone who believes. And then you have Hebrews 9. And just as each person is destined to die once, and after that comes judgment, so also Christ died for all time as a sacrifice to take away the sins of many people. He will come again not to deal with our sins, but to bring salvation to all who are eagerly waiting for him. So again, it's waiting for him. It's being part of his. It's being the one that God has given to him. And that comes by belief. So there are so many. I couldn't even possibly go through all the scriptures that talk about the different outcomes of people's death. 